thanks for joining us for this episode. Uh, if you are watching this, uh, this is Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. Today, I'll be speaking with Leon Fung of Soka. This is a car sharing company. If you're living in KL, uh, you'll probably see some of their signages, uh, including uh, one that is uh, quite prominent uh, at uh, various places in this town. So I'm going to be speaking with Leon uh, about uh, the car sharing network, um, also uh, the sharing economy at large, and more precisely about Soka and their uh, relationship with their Korean uh, partners. Uh, Leon, thanks again for having the time to share with us. Let's talk a little bit about Soka. What is it all about? So, Soka is fundamentally a rental company that has leveraged the power of technology to allow us to operate a car sharing model. So, we own the assets. So, currently in Malaysia, we own uh, almost 1,800 vehicles, right? Upon which then we use the power of our application, the Soka app, to allow any consumer to rent a car from 30 minutes anything up to 30 days. The conversation is also on how you collect the data of your customers because um, when I tried out the app, um, it was rather uh, comprehensive, I would say, uh, in terms of getting all my data. Um, why is there a need for consumers to actually uh, disclose that much of information to use your vehicles? So the, the fundamental part behind the sharing economy is asset protection. Right. In order for us to be able to operate our model and scale while ensuring that the unit economics look positive enough, what we need to ensure that is that these assets are fairly protected and not abused. As such, we have a specific KYC process, uh, Know Your Customer, where we collect details such as whether do you have a valid driver's license, uh, do you have a valid national ID if you're a foreigner trying to use our vehicle, uh, upon which when we can validate that the person is really you, that you have a valid driver's license, only then do we allow you to operate any of our shared vehicles. Uh, and one of the good news now is that uh, recently we, we've also changed our SOPs where for any local driver's license holders, as long as you enter the right information and it tallies uh, with certain government databases, we can actually approve your account instantly. There's also um, a lot of questions asked about who regulates your business. Um, is it JPJ? Uh, is it somebody else? Uh, so we're officially a registered entity with MOTEC, uh, Ministry of uh, Tourism. Uh, and un upon which, after we have the MOTEC license as an inbound travel company, uh, every single vehicle is actually licensed and permitted by APAD. Let's talk a little bit about uh, when you say protection of your assets. Um, how is the insurance plan working for you guys? Because you have a lot of riders. Yes. So. You know, fortunately, in, in Malaysia, there's a rather established uh, insurance market that currently is going through what we call the tarification. Uh, so we, we actually have a uh, comprehensive high and drive insurance commercial coverage for every single one of our vehicles. Right? However, fortunately, because of the, the, the tarification in the market, we've actually seen uh, commercial insurance rates uh, come from you know, the previous highs of what it used to be. Right? Previously, commercial insurance used to be approximately 4x, 4 times the price of private insurance. Now, it's probably come down by about 50%. Um, what about protection of drivers? Yes, yeah, so for that, uh, each driver is actually fully protected, uh, both by a personal accident coverage, as well as if there's any accident that happens, anything above the insurance excess is actually covered by the commercial insurance. W sharing economy has been going around for a bit now. Um, why uh, are you launching Soka here in Malaysia right now? So the good news is, you know, I, I've seen the mobility ecosystem really developed in Malaysia, right? Prior to to running Soka in Malaysia, uh, I, I set up the, the ride-sharing uh, company Uber in, in Malaysia. And what I realized was there was a gap in the market, right? Despite the popularity of, of ride-hailing or e-hailing, uh, there still remain a market which were highly reliant on vehicles. And that market is the people who have to travel multi-destination trips and trips ranging, say, more than 30 kilometers on a daily basis. Because if you look at e-hailing, uh, you essentially pay for both car and the driver's time. Right? If you're taking long journey, say from Shah Alam to KLCC on a daily basis, paying for the driver's time two hours a day starts becoming quite expensive. That's when you know, car sharing in the form of sole car becomes a very attractive, flexible and affordable option. And because of this gap that you're trying to close, um, is there a lot of, I, I guess, uh, reception or positive re reception towards uh, consumers with your uh, offering right now? Yeah, so I think the good news is we've, we've scaled our fleet uh, when we launched from 200 vehicles to 1,800 cars now, 
with over 900 different locations. Uh, and the key fact remains that we have uh, a customer database of close to half a million now across uh, Peninsular Malaysia. Half a million? Yes. Half a million. So you have people over half a million registered on your app? Correct. Is this part of the projection or are you overwhelmed by the whole three, uh, I guess, reception? I think a lot of it is tied back to our original mission. SoCar is about empowering drivers. We want to give drivers choice, convenience, and uh, our aim when we first launched was by 2020, we want to empower more than a million Malaysians or people living in Malaysia to go carless or give them the options to go carless. So I think we're, we're on track to achieving that. That's amazing, right? I mean, uh, but one thing that we, I, I want to know more is on the relationship they have with uh, SoCar Global or SoCar sure. Korea for that matter. How is the relationship working for Malaysian the, for the Malaysian outfit with that of Soka Global? So to clarify uh, our structure in Malaysia, we're actually a joint venture between SK Holdings and Soka Korea. Uh, SK Holdings then owns a, a further stake in Soka Korea. So SK is our uh, majority shareholder, while you know Soka Korea is our other partner in the joint venture. And so far, they've been very helpful. I think one of the key reasons why we managed to scale our business so quickly in Malaysia and actually even managed to improve on metrics such as you know, our growth rates, including a reduction of accident rates because of the uh, operational expertise uh, and experience and what we call experience data provided by our Korean counterpart. Uh, okay, we'll take a, a short break, uh, but when we come back, uh, we'll discuss a little bit more about the sharing economy uh, with uh, Leon Fong of Soka. <laughs> Thanks for staying on with us. Uh, this is Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. Joining me is Leon Fung of Soka. Uh, Leon, let's talk a little bit about the sharing economy and how it has grown uh, or metamorphed over time. Uh, do you think that the sharing economy is here to stay? Um, and what is the form and shape that we will expect the sharing economy to be uh, moving forward? So I think there's a few trends that we're very optimistic about. One of those trends is the, the positive impact on the consumer wallet that the sharing economy has. So I think the beauty of, of the sharing economy is it allows certain investments to be divided amongst many individuals. Right? What this means is from a capital expenditure perspective, from an average spend perspective, people can enjoy the same services while paying less. So that will be a trend that will remain. Uh, the question then remains in terms of how companies can sustain themselves while providing consumers with such benefits. So part of that is actually asset protection. So when we mentioned earlier, you know, insurance, uh, another key factor for us is loss rates, accident rates. So for example, uh, a great you know, positive for us is that we've seen insurance uh, accident rates in Malaysia actually be half of that of what we've seen in Korea. So from our experience of educating users, of uh, sending them the right messaging, and also fortunately because of driver behavior here, we've seen accident rates reduce from 1 in 100 to 1 in 250. Right, for example, in Malaysia. So that's a good news. The other key is asset protection. Obviously, you know, we're, we've seen the likes of uh, uh, bicycle sharing, uh, you know, old bike, mofo, uh, come and go, right? And we, we try to learn from some of those lessons, which is how do we prevent, you know, our assets from going missing or from getting stolen. So part of that uh, is actually built around not just the technology in terms of how we track the car during the reservations, but also built around the process handling, right? What do we do? Uh, where we suspect that a car is in danger of uh, being compromised. Do you put trackers on your car? Yes, we do. And why is that? Uh, well, that's because, I mean, fundamentally, we own all these assets uh, and we believe it's key for us to actually maintain protection or control over where these assets are. You know, when I asked Obike, uh, you know, when they were still up and running, yes. um, on this show, actually, behind us, the set was a bit different then, I said, um, Aren't you scared or aren't you afraid of the fact that your assets might go missing? They were actually quite bullish. They're like, oh no, Malaysians are very smart, very responsible. There's no reason for us to, uh, you know, and of course we've allocated losses, uh, you know, a percentage of all our assets. Turned out all of that projections were wrong. Um, and do you think that the projections that you're making now, of course things are not the same. I mean, we're talking about bicycles yeah. versus cars. 
But fundamentally, the projections that you are making, not just for this market, but SOCA all over the world, how confident are you that those projections will hold? So the good news is, you know, SOCA is an evolution of a business model that has been around for a long time. Car rental as an industry has existed for decades. Mm. What we've done is leverage the power of technology, right, asset tracking, uh, telematics, and uh, digital payments to really allow us to innovate around the business model or breaking down the minimum period from typically 24 hours to 30 minutes. So in that sense, I think we have a lot of good benchmarks that we base our data on. The second advantage that we have over two-wheel vehicle sharing is that G 3D GPS still isn't as important for four-wheel vehicle tracking yet. I'm sorry, 3D GPS? Yes. So right now, when we talk about GPS location tracking, uh -huh. we'll often talk about latitude and longitude. Uh -huh. right? That gives you a pretty good precision on the flat ground yeah. in terms of where your location so is. So 2D? Correct, 2D. Yeah. But suddenly, if you talk about assets, they can easily go up the lift or escalator into the basement three or 31st floor. That becomes a lot trickier, right? And I know that you're in that building, but you could be in any unit, any of these floors. Okay. And uh, that makes asset tracking become a bit of a challenge because people don't have intention to, to maybe steal an a e-scooter or a bicycle, but maybe you're just so used to bringing the asset all the way back direct to your office or to your apartment. With a car, you're a lot less likely to do that. All right. That's a very interesting way of looking at things. Um, and most importantly, uh, do you think that uh, this is uh, entering into some sort of philosophical debate? Because if you mentioned just now that uh, you know, the ownership of a particular asset is now owned by many, yeah. I guess that's more of a socialism kind of thing. But the profitability of companies like yourselves um, is moving towards capitalism. Is this, a, I guess, a new blend of capitalism and socialism being mixed, trying to enrich everyone uh, in terms of the consumers as well as the companies? I think, I think that's a great question, right? I think when you talk about capitalism, often you're talking about a, a difference between whatever the input cost is versus the, the extracted price. Yeah. I think fortunately for us, what we're seeing is that the sharing economy is lying to see a, a change in the cost curve where, where the marginal productivity on capital and marginal productivity on labor changes to an extent where a lot of these can be passed back down to the consumer. Okay. So, for example, right, instead of right, even mobile phones, previously you had to buy a mobile phone straight up. Right? Now, people are used to paying subscription plans. So that, that is an example of how uh, the, the subscription model has actually made it a lot easier for a lot more consumers to access mobile phones. Okay. So similar for us, obviously the model is different, but what we've effectively managed to do is allow people to subscribe to hourly chunks of a car when and whenever they need it. So it's almost like video on demand. That's but crazy. This, but in this case, it's car on demand. That's crazy. Yeah. I've never, I've never seen or heard anyone liken it in that manner. But there's also a conversation of sometimes technology is so ubiquitous, it's the platform uh, that is not differentiating the factor, it's the content that differentiates the factor. Everybody can own Correct. an iPhone, perhaps one can own an iPhone for five years and the thing yes. will still work fine. <laughs> the only difference here is that the content of the apps running on it that will differentiate one over the other. 100%. So you're, are, you, are you trying to equate here that uh, in an economy where it could be ubiquitous in the future, only things like this, like sharing, sharing economy or, or services that can actually benefit many will differentiate one over the other? You, you talk about content. For us, we, we look at that in terms of choice for the sole car consumer. Okay. Right? I think part of our core values is providing consumer with more choice and convenience. And there's a reason why on our platform, we have 21 different car vehicle models that you can pick from. Right? So even in the US, even in Europe, where you have car sharing companies like Car2Go, uh, they predominantly work with one car manufacturer. We work with multiple car manufacturers. Right? That's what we call kind of horizontal breadth in terms of choice. Uh, another point of convenience is also location. That's also content. Right, content needs to be readily available whenever you want it. So for us, location is very important. And there's a reason why across the past 20 months, we worked really hard to secure up to 900 different Soka zone locations. And think about it, 900 different Soka locations that you can pick up a car from across the span of 20 months. Yeah. Right? And I give you just a point of comparison. But it's mostly in KL, right? Uh, nope. So KL right now, KL and Selangor, we have about 700. Right, then we have 100 locations in Penang, 100 locations in JB. 
And uh, just to put it for comparison, uh, a big brand you know, that we're all used to, for example, like Starbucks, only has 260 locations in Malaysia. Okay. So we have 900 locations. How do you monitor all these locations? Is there a physical aspect to it? Um, somebody checks or yes. everything is like... So part of that, uh, obviously, we, we have a zone team that specifically inspects, checks these, uh, these parking operators, make sure that the operational times are valid, make sure that the, the boom gates are actually working. On top of that, you know, we, we have a telematic system which allows us to track the location of the cars uh, and also the condition of the cars. That's right. really important. So one key innovation that we've brought to the car rental model is that we've actually shortened the, the downtime that typically is related to car washes and what we call uh, car, and, car servicing and car inspection. I, I now see your point when you say you reduce the cost uh, curve element uh, and perhaps try to improve on the efficiency of your services. Uh, but that also means that there's a lot of technology driving this. Uh, no way that you can do this manually over time. What is the plan of doing things automat automatically or automating your processes uh, behind the scene? So, it's a term that's been very commonly used, but I strongly believe in, in the power of data. So, for example, the power also, of data... That is also a term that people don't commonly use, the power uh, of data. Yeah, the power of data uh, across multiple transactions has allowed us to predict at a specific location uh, when the downtimes are going to be, okay. right? when users are not going to be using these cars. These are the hours where we want to go in there, service the cars, wash the cars, ensure that they're clean for the next reservation. Okay. So there's some element of machine learning and, and predictive technology that we use that. Uh, but that's not going to be effective if we don't combine that data together with a very effective uh, operational team. So what we do is we, we then use the data then we have certain vendors, certain partners, and in-house uh, you know, resources that we work with that will then use that data to schedule their day-to-day -day or their hourly-to-hourly -hourly, uh, priorities in terms of which cars to clean first, which cars to send to servicing, which cars to actually take off the platform to deactivate because they're not fit for use. All right. <laughs> we'll take a short break. Uh, when we come back, we'll discuss more with Leon of Soka. <laughs> Thanks for staying on with us. I'm with Leon Fong of Soka. Leon, uh, when we scheduled for this interview, um, it came to my, uh, I guess, attention that you have a rich background in terms of experiences and most importantly, the education that you had uh, from Oxford University. How does all that tie up with how you do your things right now? You were alluding to some of the work that you did in Uber. Does that help in how to build a local business here? I think fundamentally what has really driven me in terms of my career is actually my passion for economics. So whether we look at the e-hailing industry or the car sharing industry, and I loved it when you talked about you know, uh, resource sharing versus the idea of capitalism, because as an economics major myself, I'm incredibly passionate about real life implications on technology, on the economics, right? Whether it's in transportation, whether it's mobility, or even in all areas touched by the sharing economy. And I think one thing that I'm proud to be able to do, or I feel super fortunate to be able to do, is apply my learnings and run real life experiments. So for example, uh, you know, with, with SoCar, we run pricing experiments all the time. Okay. Right? We, we talk about price sensitivity yeah. as a concept yeah. in, um, in economics. We talk about demand elasticity, but not many people get to see the impact and measure it in real time and really understand what the demand curve looks like. Uh, so putting the action to where the theory is. Correct. For yeah. me, I get to break down cities, for example, Kuala Lumpur, into individual neighborhoods, individual areas, and really understand the pricing elasticities for different car models in each area. And using the data help me optimize the utilization of assets. That for me is super fun. Right? And I think part of that is also the key behind the sole car business model in terms of how we can offer our consumers the cars they want at the best possible pricing while ensuring that at the right time, you'll still be able to get the cars and make sure that they're available. I can bet you what you think is fun is not what the majority of the human beings think is fun. But I can see where you're getting at. You get, you get a kick from doing these things. 
Um, does this mean that this is just one of the many experiments in that you will do? Um, is there more to Leon of Soka? Will you try something new? <laughs> will you even roll out something different? Uh, let me try out or test out all your economic theories out there. Uh, so I think, I think it's a really interesting topic these days is, is obviously people talk about motorbike sharing and potentially new entrants coming in both locally as well as uh, potential foreign players such as you know the Indonesian giant. Yeah. Uh, I think the reason... Or something yeah, else. Dago, right? Yeah. And Gojek. Yeah, Gojek. Uh, I think for Soka, we, we call ourselves an ecosystem partner. We, we find such trends super interesting because of, of a few things. First of all, at Soka, obviously, we, we do four-wheel car sharing right now. Right? We, we, we obviously have thought about two-wheel vehicle uh, sharing, but obviously the safety aspect remains very questionable. Right? And we would like to understand how, first of all, we can protect both consumers as well as the, the assets. So for example, if you look at Malaysia traffic accident rates, right, we see in excess of uh, 10,000 fatalities on, a, on an annual basis, of which 60% come from motorcycles. Right? So that's significantly more than uh, four-wheel related uh, deaths. And part of that is obviously to do with the design, the engineering design of, of a two-wheel vehicle. So how do we address issues like that? But versus the other side, which we, we, we acknowledge, which is the need for cheaper, more affordable, micro mobility options uh, that you know two wheel e scooters or bikes can provide then the question is how do you balance that need for safety versus that the need to drive down the, the unit cost of transportation while complementing the existing investment in the public transportation uh, infrastructure i mean it also talks about different business cases that you're trying to solve because uh, early in this interview we're talking about you know 30 kilometer range Correct. multi uh, i guess uh, destinations those are the things that you, you're trying to solve with a four-wheel vehicle. Yes. You might not be able to solve it with an e-scooter. I mean, I can't imagine going 30 kilometers on an e-scooter. So or on also, the max. it is not just about vehicle sharing then. It's about creating a new value proposition altogether and whether or not it makes sense, not just from the safety perspective, but from the economic perspective as well. Uh, do you believe that uh, because of this, there is a time and need for you to really think hard about launching a two-wheel vehicle <laughs> ride-sharing after the success of uh, uh, a four-wheel vehicle uh, sharing uh, company? I think a huge part of that depends on the service infrastructure that's existing in different cities. <laughs> so for some cities, I think they're, they're born perfect or they're designed perfectly for micro-mobility. Mm. These are cities which are very dense, cities which are fairly flat where there's not a lot of inclined uh, transportation and cities where you don't have many hills right because obviously you know to cycle or use an e-scooter to go up a hill or especially with a passenger behind you that that becomes fundamentally quite challenging mm. uh, if you look at the Klang Valley the density uh, in terms of number of people per, per square kilometer in terms of number of retail outlets or uh, residences per square kilometer is just not the same as a Singapore or even a Bangkok or even central Jakarta so what this means is, I think we need to understand in a city which doesn't have that natural density, how do we offer micro-mobility in a way that consumers want, in a way that consumers are protected, as well as in a way where we can generate new economic opportunities. Okay. Final question, Soka is still a privately held company. Um, what are the plans for you to, I guess, raise more funds or even go public even? So over the past 20 months, I think we've been very encouraged by the numbers that we've seen. Right? Obviously, we've invested a lot into the, the national automobile industry. Right? Most of the cars that we purchase, that we invest in, are locally assembled or locally manufactured. Uh, and I think you know, with the success that we've seen in Malaysia, with the number of consumers embracing the, the sole car brand of you know, multi-flex transportation, uh, what we want to do is invest more in this market, in this region, and potentially consider new business models and expand beyond Malaysia as well. So as part of that, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're actively seeking to, to find ways to finance that, that expansion, uh, which you know, I'm sure that you know, many potentially new partners might be interested in, in uh, looking at. Wait, hang on. So are you alluding to the fact that you're growing out of Malaysia but using Malaysia as a base? <laughs> we see Malaysia as a hub, very much so. And why is that? What, what, what makes us a hub or, or possible hub for a regional expansion? Uh, I, I think a few, few things are great here, both in terms of access to talent Right, in terms of the overall IT infrastructure and the fact that you know, Malaysia is, uh, whether you know, not many people actually acknowledge it, but one of the few countries which is, has actually fairly advanced transportation regulations when it comes to dealing with shared mobility. We do? Yeah. 
compared to others, I mean. Yes. So, for example, in Malaysia, we have official regulations around e-hailing, while Thailand doesn't. Uh, yeah. But well, we have a lot of noise as well from a lot of people trying to say things are unfair and stuff. There, like there that. is a process, but I think at least the appetite towards more innovative regulations is there. Mm. Uh, I think now we're just going to combine the appetite with the right execution. Okay, thank you very much. That was Leon Fung of Soka. If you missed any part of this interview, just head on to astronaut.com. Look for Notepad. You can also watch this interview on your mobile devices. Just download the Astronaut app wherever you get uh, the application. Until next time, thanks very much for watching and goodbye. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.